Ashmita. You can start, ma'am. Okay, great. We can start. Ganvi? Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, good evening, one and all. We welcome you to another episode of the Wednesday Special Thyroid Clinics organized by the Indian Thyroid Society, which is nothing less than a knowledge feast. So uh, uh, the Indian Thyroid Society, that I think we can skip the thyroid quiz, uh, quiz rules. So uh, Indian Thyroid Society Thyroid Clinics uh, is being conducted under the leadership of the four most eminent conveners. So can we have that slide, please, Asmita? Can we skip this slide? <clears throat> so uh, the Indian Thyroid Society, the Thyroid Clinics webinar, which is being conducted every fortnightly is under the leadership of the foremost eminent conveners, Professor Sarita Bajaj, Madam, who is presently the president of uh, Indian Thyroid Society, Dr. Pramila Kalra, Madam, who is the scientific chair, Dr. Mini G. Pillai, Ma'am, who is the treasurer, and uh, Dr. Arun Menansa, who is the secretary. Uh, so today's program, uh, we have Dr. KVS Harikumar, sir, as the moderator. So can we have the next slide? Yes. Uh, we have the dialogue by Dr. Sanjay Padada, sir, and Dr. Nitin Kapoor on bone health in the spectrum of thyroid disorders. Uh, learning with clinical scenarios, followed by monologue by Dr. Sanjay Badada, sir, on preoperative management of patients with thyroid disorders undergoing non-thyroid surgery, followed by quiz by Dr. Saumik Goswami, sir. Uh, so um, uh, without further delay, uh, so we will start the session with the introduction of our uh, distinguished moderator, Dr. KVS Harikumar, sir. So can we have the introductory slide of Dr. KVS Harikumar, yes. Uh, so, sir is presently the uh, consultant endocrinologist at Magna Clinics and Fernandez Hospitals, Handbar. Sir has about 220 publications in peer reviewed as well as PubMed Exitex journals. Sir has many achievements and awards to his credit. Uh, a few of them are the Shakuntala Amirchan and as well as MN Sain Oration Award from ICMR New Delhi. Also, the Dr. J.S. Pajaj Oration Award from NAMS, New Delhi, Dr. A.R. Seth Gold Medal Award from ESI, the Thyroid Rising Star Oration from the Indian Thyroid Society, and the Young Investigator Award from RSSDI, API, and UPDA. Sir has also received the Best Referee and the Best Article Award from the IJEF. Uh, so, over to you, sir, uh, to start the dialogue session with the introduction of Dr. Uh, Sanjay Badada, sir, and Dr. Nitin Kapoor. Thank you, Dr. Ganvi, and uh, good evening to everybody. And thanks to Professor Bajaj, Madam, Dr. Arun, and the entire team of the ITS for inviting me. Uh, we are actually, I mean, uh, to introduce Professor Barada is going to be the biggest difficulty for me, <laughs> but uh, everybody in the world knows. I mean, actually, yeah. rightly to say only one word is the bone man of India. So you won't get a best person to see actually to discuss about the dialogue. And uh, you're going to have in partnership with him, Dr. Nitin Kapoor, who is also no less and possibly the obesity man of India. So who will discuss not particularly to obesity, but actually something to do with thyroid and the bone aspects and uh, a good quiz and a good orator, orator who is Dr. Swamik will be following with this and then we'll have the uh, final concluding remarks. Uh, so with that, I welcome everybody for this uh, session of the thyroid clinics and over to Dr. Barada and Dr. Nitin. Yeah. So uh, very good evening to all of you and uh, thank you Dr. Hari for profuse introduction indeed. And uh, thank you, Madam Bajaj, for this opportunity and the whole ITS, Dr. Arun, Dr. Ganvi, and Dr. Migni. So thank you for this bringing this important topic uh, just prior to the night of the World Osteoporosis Day that is falling tomorrow. And indeed, the day before was the World Menopause Day. 18th October was World Menopause Day and the 20th is World Osteoporosis Day. So I think that is a no better uh, day to celebrate is how the connection of thyroid and bone. So, Dr. Nitin, are you there? Yes, I am there. And I'd okay. also like to thank uh, Dr. Bajaj and the entire ITS team. It's great to be back on the ITS platform. Thank you, Dr. Hari, for that introduction. Yeah. 
so uh, what we are going to do is we have some introduction uh, discussion uh, with dr nitin as a part of dialogue and then uh, our senior resident from pgi dr subin is going to present a interesting case on the thyroid and bone interaction and then uh, finally we have some more discussion on that so uh, dr nitin i think uh, i just to an introduction i'd say that uh, before thyroid and parathyroid both are neighbors endocrine neighbor glands and uh, before discovery of the parathyroid actually the how thyroid hormones can affect bone was discovered and the i think bone tricklingson in 1891 he described that uh, thyroid causes a woman bone and that is responsible for the significant effect on the bone and mineral metabolism that includes fracture and all these things so uh, uh so in uh, basically the thyroid and bone was a major problem till 1940 the anti thyroid drugs came into the picture and the radio iodine ablation was available for the treatment so uh, dr nitin what do you feel that uh, what is the spectrum of thyroid bone thyroid defect on the bone mineral metabolism so what are the various disorders you can briefly discuss and the give throw some light before we go on to the case presentation thank you sir and as you said so very rightly uh, on the eve of world osteoporosis day the theme for this year is step up for bone health and thyroid is definitely one of the steps up uh, that we can take to improve bone health and as you ask uh, how we link thyroid and bone neighboring glands but uh, there are several ways in which we can link it we often talk about the impact of primary thyroid disorders on bone both primary hypothyroidism and more importantly primary hyperthyroidism and again we talk about this differently in children and adults we also have emerging literature on subclinical thyroid disease and its impact on bone subclinical hyperthyroidism especially in particular another very important area that links thyroid and bone is thyroid malignancies this could be either in the form of uh, metastatic bone disease but also uh, in the form of suppressive thyroxine therapy that we'll discuss during this session and rarely we can have some common disorders which affect both thyroid and bone these are rare uh, syndromic causes like MEN2, where we talk of metallic carcinoma of the thyroid and primary hyperparathyroidism, or at times simple uh, clusters of autoimmune disorders, autoimmune syndromes, where autoimmune etiology for hypopara and uh, hypothyroidism. Now these are rare, but by and large, the most important uh, would be uh, the primary thyroid disorders occurring in children, both hyper and hypo, and in adults, uh, hypo and hyperthyroidism. so uh, dr nitin i totally agree with you that uh, optimum amount of thyroid hormones is very important to maintain the bone health either if it is a hormone deficiency of the thyroid hormone or the excess of the thyroid hormone both are detrimental and sometime i say that uh, three hormones t3 t4 tsh three cells osteoblast osteoclast and osteocyte and three receptors trf tr alpha 1 tr beta 1 and tr beta 2 so that is a nice jugal bandhi between all three and how they interact and interplay with each other uh, we'll go further on this and before that i'll invite uh, to set the uh, uh, kind of as you mentioned the metastasis or the bone bone malignancy can significantly affect the thyroid hormone so dr subin is going to present an interesting case So, Dr. Subin, you can share your slide. Dr. Subin is senior resident in our department and is very bright fellow, very hardworking and sincere. So, over to Dr. Subin. Yes, Dr. Subin, you can now uh, start your presentation. Share the in the presentation mode. Slide show, please. Subin, yeah, good, good, yeah. 
We can't hear you. Hello. Yes, you are. Subin. Hello, Subin. Hello. Okay. Uh, we'll continue with that, uh, Dr. Nitin. Meanwhile, I think let the Subin uh, voice is not coming. So as was, I was mentioning these, uh, the, the three, three cells, three receptors, and the three hormones. So... Uh, Basically, which hormone has a maximum effect on the bone? So, though we most of the time in our clinical practice, we give due attention to the T4 and the TSH. But I think here is a little bit different because uh, the T3 has a major role on the uh, uh, in the thyroid and bone as compared to the T4. So, that is there. So, uh, yes, Dr. Nitin, yeah. So, uh, so as you rightly said, but again, uh, many uh, people would concentrate on uh, T4 and T3, but TSH, uh, again, uh, the presence of TSH receptor on these uh, cells on the bone has also gained a lot of attention in the last few decades, where uh, they say that TSH receptors which are present on these osteoblasts have a protective effect. So when we talk of this suppressive therapy, uh, which happens in thyroid cancer, so TSH deficiency uh, is also detrimental to the bone. And this is something that uh, many times uh, we may not uh, look into in subclinical thyroid disease. So as I, I completely agree, T3 is the most important. T4 is talked about most, but TSH shouldn't be forgotten also. Yeah. So you are correct that you are telling that TSH is directly correlation, having a correlation with the bone mineral density. So in a patient of, uh, say, thyroid metastasis or the malignancy, We'll treat this patient with the suppressive therapy, or uh, then obviously they are going to cause the harm to the uh, bone and mineral metabolism. So uh, let's see what happens when the TSH is high to the bone health. If the TSH low is harmful, what happens to TSH high to the bone health? Yes, sir. so TSH high in bone health, uh, the overall uh, understanding is that there is a suppressed uh, bone turnover state. This is in primary hypothyroidism per se, when the T4 is low and the TSH is high. Overall, the bone metabolism, the bone turnover is all very suppressed, especially in adults. There's low bone turnover. There may be some kind of uh, a little sclerotic picture of the bone, but the bone is still very fragile and uh, the fracture risk is increased. The osteosclerosis, which may be uh, apparent, but overall, in patients with primary hypothyroidism, which have who have a high TSH, the fracture risk will be increased. But if we are just talking of high TSH without primary hypothyroidism, if you are asking the direct effect of TSH on the bone, it does work on the osteoblast and uh, causes uh, an increase in the bone formation uh, per se. Yeah. So you are correct that because of the high TSH is having relationship with the bone mineral density. Though the BMD is high, but the still fracture risk is increased in the hypothyroidism, like in hyperthyroidism. It is something like that we can say uh, hypoparathyroidism. Like right. bone mineral density is high in hypoparathyroidism, but there is increased risk of fracture. Similar, the condition here is that uh, in hypothyroidism, the TSH is high and the BMD is high, but that is causing the basically increased fragility. So uh, that is there. So, uh, Dr. Nitin, uh, because now metastasis is the major problem in the follicular thyroid carcinoma, it is not uncommon in our clinical practice that uh, patient directly presenting with the bone metastasis. And right. I'll share you the interesting patient uh, last week I've seen in our OPD, that patient presented with the swelling in the right temporal region. And obviously swelling in the temporal region, so he reached to the neurosurgeon actually. The neurosurgeon operated the patient, oh. operated the patient, and the histopathology turned out to be a follicular thyroid carcinoma. So the how it is a reverse diagnosis is made the presenting with the metastasis, and we know that uh, various follicular thyroid carcinoma are presenting with the uh, metastasis of the spine, skull, and other long bones. So that is already uh, very well known actually. So. Uh, 
so i think there's another important thing is so now it is clear that uh, we require the optimum amount of uh, thyroid hormone for the good bone health so in the patient those are on the thyroid suppressive therapy for the metastasis or malignancy so how we can protect the bones that is i think an important uh, would you like to discuss something about that how we can yes, protect sir. the bone yes sir. so two important things that i'd like to highlight here so very important for us as clinicians to maintain this balance where we don't want the tsh to be high so that the malignancy part is well taken care of but at the same time we don't want a uh, unnecessary high thyroid hormone which is bad for the bone so the first important thing to strike the balance is to know our risk category of our patient with thyroid cancer and give the optimal tsh range that we would like to so there are very clear guidelines uh, the one which was published by the american thyroid association in 2015 for the differentiated thyroid cancer so just three important points for all the post graduates who are listening to us today so if your patient with thyroid cancer has structural residual disease that means the surgeon has not been able to remove the entire thyroid gland then there is no doubt that we have to give thyroxin to suppress the tsh and the guidelines very clearly mention the value of tsh in these patients should be less than 0.1 ml international units per liter but that is for people who have structural residual thyroid disease now if the surgeon has done a fantastic job and says it's a r0 resection they have removed everything very well and uh, there may be some amount of thyroglobulin which is detectable that means the biochemical response is not complete but structural response is there and overall pre operatively it was just like an intermediate kind of a disease in these patients we would like to maintain a tsh between 0.1 to 0.5 ml international units per liter and this is for 5 years this is not like life long we decide based on the first thing we can obviously follow up the patient and look as to how we are improving but the third important category and a lot of our patients uh, if they have not had metastatic disease if they have not required adjuvant disease if their thyroglobulin is undetectable now these are patients who had low risk thyroid cancer so for them our cutoffs are 0.5 to 2 ml international units per liter so i think for us as clinicians very important to categorize our patients risk category and therefore prescribe the thyroxine dose to maintain these uh, tss targets because we know both high t4 and low tsh are bad this is one part but again as our teacher dr sheshadri always used to say that when we are managing the patient we have to look at the patient as a whole and the other risk factors for osteoporosis have to be looked into so if i have a post menopausal lady elderly lady who is vitamin d deficient not taking adequate calcium i need to make sure that that part is also addressed having thyroid disease is just adding a uh, probably burden to the osteoporosis but replacing the adequate amount of calcium in a post menopausal lady giving that much uh, either through diet plus a calcium supplement and replacing the vitamin d as per the ispmr guidelines i think that is also very very important to address yeah nitin very well said uh, because uh, uh, it is correct that uh, uh, you have to judiciously use the thyroid hormone replacement or suppression that is very clear because all the patient we may not require to suppress the tsh very low so that is one thing and the second thing is that uh, we have to supplement adequate with the calcium and vitamin d and maybe other non pharmacological measures should be taken care in addition to this uh, the actually the post menopausal females are most adversely affected so probably we have to take care of them even better as compared to the pre menopausal female the female or the male patients uh, with relation to this i think with that uh, i can have my presentation Uh, so that uh, meanwhile we can have comments i while i shared my screen uh, we can have a comment from major general rk marwa sir on this uh, discussion he can give his uh, crisp and the important comments meanwhile i'll share my uh, screen so uh, dr ganvi will you allow me to share my screen meanwhile marwa sir will give some comment uh, yes yeah. yes the it team uh, asmita Yes, ma'am. I'll give you the share. Sir, you can share. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Doctor Marwa, you are mute. Doctor Marwa, you mute.
Dr. Marva, you are mute. Well, we cannot hear you, sir. Uh, maybe, sir, put some... Hello. Hello. Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, no, Not sir. Yet, sir. No. Now? No. No, oh, sir. Just click on share, sir. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just, just a minute. Sometime. In the, uh, in the meanwhile period, uh, can I ask a small question to Dr. Nitin? Yeah, 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 please. Yeah. Dr. Yes, Nitin, sir. your comments of using anti resorptives in a, say, elderly thyrotoxic lady at the presentation? Yes, so if Right, sir. So there, there are no specific guidelines for hyperthyroidism, but as per clinical practice, we would like to uh, assess the fracture risk. Now, when we look at different uh, meta-analysis, which I looked at uh, people uh, with thyroid cancer and uh, having their fracture risk, uh, there, there are several analyses which talk about a much higher major osteoporotic uh, risk for fracture, maybe about 7%, and femur fracture about 5% over a period of five years. So uh, we have to aggressively treat. There is no contraindication for using bisphosphonates or denosumab in these patients. Uh, so I think the best way would be to assess their bone mineral density, to assess their fracture risk, uh, as we would usually do in uh, postmenopausal women, and then keep our thresholds really low uh, for starting treatment. So, But there are no specific guidelines that what T-score uh, would I... Uh, start treatment. So if you look at the ISBMR guidelines for management of postmenopausal osteoporosis, they do talk about using uh, treatment for such patients who may have secondary osteoporosis even in the osteopenic range. But maybe I'll request Dr. Badada to add uh, whether what would be the threshold in patients with thyroid cancer to give anti -resorptive. Yeah, I think uh, there is no as such separate guideline that what is the threshold. But uh, it is obviously clear that in the case of hyperthyroidism or the, on the suppressive therapy, there is a marked reduction in the uh, bone remodeling cycle, actually. There is first two parts are prolonged. The last two parts are actually shortened. So obviously, in this case, we cannot treat with the obviously teriparatide because there is a contraindication to the malignancy part. But there is no separate guideline and we can use as a standard criteria like this. So maybe we can take some help of the bone turn or markers regarding this. So my slides are visible now? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, may I, yes, Dr. Sir. Hari, may I have permission to start my presentation? Sir, please, sir. Yeah. So uh, thank you once again for uh, allowing me to talk on this then important topic, which is, I think, in our day-to-day -day practice, very common. Maybe in our OPD, we see at least five to 10 patients every day to uh, for the surgical clearance that build up to the non-thyroid surgery in a patient of hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. So here's the outline that what are the recommendations for screening? Uh, what are the perioperative morbidity in patients with hypo and hyperthyroidism? Build up to surgery in hypo and hyperthyroidism patients and the management. So First question is, should we screen all the patients for the thyroid disorders coming for the surgery? So answer is no. The history and physical examination is suggestive of thyroid disease. Don't, then and then only we'll screen them. Second is patient with non-thyroid disease taking thyroid medication as adjustment needed to maintain euthyroidism. That is fine. In patients with well-compensated thyroid disease, if the patient is on the stable medication and euthyroidism was documented within past three to six months, additional testing prior to surgery is not necessary because thyroid hormone is a prolonged half-life. So it is not every patient is required, but in certain situations, it is screening is recommended. So if we find the thyroid disorders, as Dr. Nitin said in his opening remark that subclinical hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, clinical hypo or hyperthyroidism, overt hypo or hyperthyroidism. So
so generally we come across three conditions like where is degree of thyroid dysfunction that is subclinical state or overt state then comes is the elective or the emergency surgery that is local anesthesia under local anesthesia under spinal anesthesia or under general surgery and finally what are the underlying cardiopulmonary disease or decompensation so before cleaning any patient for the thyroid dysfunction we have to come across all these three things that is degree of thyroid dysfunction the type of surgery or type of anesthesia and the cardiopulmonary decompensation so a uh, severity of the hypothyroidism we all know that mild hypothyroidism called subclinical hypothyroidism mainly on the serum t4 is free serum t4 is low otherwise there is no symptom and sorry normal serum free t4 and no symptom and the uh, tsh only is elevated the other category is moderate hypothyroidism where you can say that uh patients with the low free t4 and elevated tss but no obvious symptoms of the hypothyroidism while in case of severe hypothyroidism where the t3 is low t4 is low tsh is elevated and patient is having the symptoms so this is the three category of the on the basis of severity of the hypothyroidism so hypothyroidism patients are actually can if not treated adequately they can develop the hypotension they can have the major adverse cardiac events like mi and stroke during the surgery period or in post operative period they can have the atrial fibrillation there is significant effect with relation to the pulmonary system and the hemostatic or the hematological system in case of pulmonary system they can have difficult intubation and that may be decreased ventilatory drive will delay in the recovery after the anesthesia or they can have the decreased surfactant level and which were and the atelectasis and sometimes they can have the because of the respiratory muscle dysfunction can cause operative lung collapse and risk of the pneumonia and obviously there is a significant effect on the hematological manifestations of hypothyroidism as are there and patient can develop the anemia and there is acquired von willebrand disease deficiency the von willebrand disease and that can cause increased risk of the surgical site bleeding they also have the significant effect on the renal system as well as on the gastrointestinal system and many time we have seen the patient of the hypothyroidism they are operated without diagnosing because the mixed edema coma patient sometime present like intestinal obstruction and not treated appropriately prior they can have the uh, difficult in the paralytic ileus mega colon and that can be responsible for the increased mortality so there are the various studies are there which they compared in the patients of youth thyroid and the subclinical hypothyroidism after the surgery and what they found is that there is not significant uh, outcome difference except they have documented that in the post operative period increase atrial fibrillation was there in the subclinical hypothyroidism patient as compared to the youth thyroid patients so there is lot of guidelines are there in the uh, how to manage the patients of mild hypothyroidism prior to surgery the recent guideline by by the uh, basically by the american thyroid association and then international expert panel from the british uh, british british as they said that levothyroxine is generally recommended against for those with subclinical hypothyroidism with the exception of the women or those are trying to conceive or those with the serum tss greater than 20 so it is like our clinical practice we use the more than 10 we start the treatment so they said that in case of the mild hypothyroidism no need for the treatment except in the certain situations now coming to the moderate hypothyroidism so there is elective surgery best is to postpone the elective surgery until patient achieve the youth thyroidism in case of urgent surgery patient can be subjected for the surgery or allow to undergo surgery but they should be uh, say uh, they should be uh, informed about the surgeon that there are the possible complication they should be treated and patient should be treated with the uh, full replacement dose of levothyroxine before starting on the surgery and uh, in case of the the moderate hypothyroidism with there is a cardiopulmonary disease in that case we can give the uh we should go slow that is in the dose of 20 to 50 microgram daily and then increase every 2 to 6 weeks in case of uh complications in surgery with the severe hypothyroidism is that the patient can develop the 
uh, basically mild to moderate hypothalamus were compared with the 80 youth are surgical patients and they documented some of the complications like as i mentioned in the previous slide that intraoperative hypotension the heart failure and uh, but there is no significant difference is observed again in the moderate hypothyroidism in case of severe hypothyroidism how to deal with this that so in severe hypothyroidism if the surgery is elective then elective surgery should be delayed until hypothyroidism has been treated effectively or the euthyroidism achieved if the surgery is an emergency obviously there is no option so we have to treat this uh, take the patient for the emergency surgery and then they recommend that uh, you can give the combination of T4 and T3. And the T4 is given in the loading dose, that is the 200 to 300 microgram intravenously, followed by the 50 milligram daily. And the same time, if T3 is available, of course, the T3 right now not available, not access in the, at least in our city. But uh, I remember that the, the CMC value, it is available or they are making their pharmacy. I'm not sure, but there is some information on that. No? Okay. So if that is not there, then we should treat with the loading dose of 200 to 300 microgram of the IV T4 and the followed by 50 microgram IV daily. And the patient should be adequately covered with the stress doses of the corticosteroid until the integrity of the axis is uh, correctly known. Now that... Uh, in case of in case of presence of the coronary artery disease is there, then we have to go slow as in the as we do in the our clinical practice that we should start with the low dose and gradually build up this over a period of two to six weeks. Now coming to the hyperthyroidism, uh, on the contrary to hypothyroidism, in hyperthyroidism that increased cardiac output and by 50 to 300 percent, and that's where the patient that are at risk for the atrial fibrillation in patients of the uh, hyperthyroidism. Now, management in patients of the uh, various conditions of the hyperthyroidism, like if the subclinical hyperthyroidism is there, and which is we know that defined by the low TSH with the normal free T4. So, in such patients, patients with the subclinical hyperthyroidism can be proceed with the elective or the urgent surgery similar to the mild hypothyroidism. Unless, until unless there is a contraindication, contraindicated, and we have to administer a beta blocker, preferably atinolol in the dose of 20 to 50 milligram per day. And the older patients or the younger patients, the cardiovascular disease, especially arrhythmia, and then in that case, uh, we have to taper that uh, mm -hmm. after the recovery of these uh, beta blockers. So in subclinical hypothyroidism, not, not much worry is there. You can treat with the beta blocker and patient can be subjected for this surgery. While in case of overt hyperthyroidism, which is defined as suppressed TSH with elevated free T4 concentration. So elective surgery, like in the uh, overt hypothyroidism, should be postponed till the uh, uh, till the, you achieve the euthyroidism. While in case of overt hyperthyroidism, it is a little bit a tricky situation. And if the surgery is urgent, then what we can plan, as I am showing here, is that the treatment is directed against the thyroid gland. Treatment is directed against the peripheral effects of thyroid hormone. And treatment is directed against the systemic decompensation. So the treatment uh, directed against thyroid gland is, you can use thionamide and iodine. While in case of the, uh, for the peripheral effects to reduce that, we can use the beta blockers and the glucocorticoids. And for the systemic purpose, we have to correct with the, uh, a fluid and electrolyte balance and adequate nutrition is required before subjecting the patient for the urgent surgery. So a word about the thionomides. So the important thing about the thionomide is that thionomide blocks the de novo thyroid hormone synthesis but does not have any effect on the thyroid hormone release from the thyroid gland. Therefore, not have a significant uh, effect on thyroid hormone level or only, uh, only a few pre-operative days. So we have to use some other uh, measures to release, to inhibit the release of the thyroid hormone from the thyroid gland before subjecting the patient for the surgery. And the dosing of the hyperthyroidism, degree of uh, dosing of the thionamide depends on the degree of hyperthyroidism. Either it is a biochemical or it is a clinical. Few people prefer to use the profile thyroid in a dose of 100 to 150 milligram 
every six to hours because it uh, it inhibits the conversion of T4 to T3 conversion. Coming to the iodine, though iodine is available in the various preparation that is potassium iodide solution, super saturated solution of potassium iodide or one of the one to five drops three times daily is usually given. Before, uh, uh, before that we have to give the thionamide, otherwise it can cause the thyroid storm kind of the uh, situation. And the thionamide therapy should be therefore be started first and continued without interruption, preferably in the dividing doses. But this situation many same time, many times is very difficult when the patient is having liver dysfunction. Then how to treat that is a totally different. The patient with the pregnancy, they have the urgent requirement, urgent surgery. Then some of the drugs are actually contraindicated that causes the problem in the management of the uh, hyperthyroid patient for the surgery. But people do use the hyponoic acid, which is also rich in iodine. And that will block both release of T4 and T3 from the gland, as well as it inhibits the conversion of T4 to T3. So that is another good choice to take the or circumvent the urgent or the emergency situation. Beta blockers, as I mentioned, longer acting beta blockers uh, like etinolol are preferred and it is given the dose of 20 to 50 milligram daily till we achieve the heart rate of 80 beats per minute or we can use IV propranolol, which is the short acting that can be given uh, intravenously and uh, beta blockers should be continued until the patient's thyroid disease is under control. Patient with relative contraindication to beta blockers uh, may be better to tolerate the beta-1 selective drugs and for the calcium channel blocker also can be used for the if the beta blockers are contraindicated. So I think uh, already mentioned about hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism comparison. So I am coming to the final slide or the conclusion slide that if the US subclinical hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, which can be moderate or which can be severe. So subclinical hypo or hyperthyroidism, no built-up therapy is required. Patient can be subjected for the surgery. If you moderate hypothyroidism, elective, wait till you achieve the euthyroidism. In case of emergency, give LT4 orally, proceed with surgery, keeping the risk in mind and inform anesthetist and the surgeon what are the possible problems patient can develop and ready for that. If there is overt hyperthyroidism, so basically, we have to manage the impending thyroid storm. We have to prepare like this. In case of severe hyperthyroidism, elective surgery to be deferred till you achieve the euthyroid and emergency surgery can be done with the help of giving thionomides, iodine and other measures on the control of the heart rate by the uh, what you call uh, beta blockers. In case of severe hyperthyroid, hypothyroidism, you give the intravenous LT4 therapy and uh, of course, sometimes it is not available. In that case, you give orally also and give the loading dose and followed by the oral 100 milligram per day or IV 200 milligram uh, microgram state and they followed by the 50 microgram daily. So I'll end my presentation here by this uh, take home message slide. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the excellent overview. A couple of questions. Uh, yeah. First thing is, uh, should we wait for T3, T4, uh, I mean, TSH normalization for six weeks or should we go by T3, T4? What is yeah, your comment I, on? Absolutely correct. So, need not to wait to the normalize the TSH. If the T4 and T3 is normalized, patient can be taken for the surgery. But as I mentioned, the elective surgery, if there is no hurry, we can wait to normalize that, yes. And second question is, should we give prophylactic steroids in all patients with severe hypothyroid? Yeah, so uh, severe hypothyroid. Yeah. yeah, so if we are not sure, uh, yeah, if we have the cortisol level in hand, that's fine. If we don't have the cortisol level, in that case, I think it is better to give a short of uh, what you call in case so emergency, we can give a, the, a cortisol a supplement, then we can plan the surgery. Otherwise, because of the stress, if there is uh, what we call adrenal glands are get lazy in case of hypothyroidism, and they may not respond to 
adequately. So it is preferred to give the uh, uh, cortisol replacement before planning the surgery if you don't have the cortisol level. And uh, in hyperthyroidism, steroids. Steroids in emergency surgery, hyperthyroidism. Yeah, steroids in emergency surgery, the people do use because again, there is increased metabolism of the cortisol that is there. So obviously there is some, some amount of deficiencies. You can say relative deficiency is there. And then uh, actually the thyroid storm is a situation where that the requirement is increased significantly. So I believe that is the preferred way to use that, yes. Yeah, some peripheral actions also which should contribute whatever we get so, no other persons no? Uh, no even more okay with steroid like sa or uh, hydrocort what do you prefer uh we prefer hydrocortisone only and i think injectable preparation is available with you <laughs> ask this question to me or anyone else sorry I... no 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 sir this is uh, some chat box these are posted in chat box persons. okay 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 yeah. So I think we, we prefer hydrocortisone only and sometimes uh, if there is severe deficiency we do give the infusion also in addition to uh, the uh, uh, IV uh, shots, infusion is sometimes preferred. I think uh, for the view of the time constraints we will stop here and move to the next session. That is the quiz by Dr. Saumik, who is a faculty professor from NRS Medical College, Kolkata. And uh, over to Dr. Saumik now. Can Dr. Subin uh, not come in, no? Sanjay? Yeah, just I think he should be there. I, he, shall I ask uh, Dr. Subin? Dr. Subin? Uh, hello? Hello? Yeah, yes, he is there. Yeah. Can uh, you? Dr. Hani, is it okay if we have the case presentation? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. No problem. Yeah. Good. Uh, uh, sir, is my uh, screen yes, visible? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah you are audible. audible. Your slides are also visible, please. Okay, Go okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sorry for the delay. So, uh, I will uh, go into the case right away. So, this is story of 48-year-old female from Punjab. She's a housewife. She is known to have a long uh, standing history of uh, goiter. She was otherwise healthy. She presented with a history of weakness of uh, bilateral ovulum since three months. And she came to us with history of urinary retention for past one week. So, uh, history of present illness. So, this is a story of 14 year old female with background history of neck swelling for the past 18 years. She presented to us with a history of gradually progressive weakness of bilateral ovulum since three months. Initially, she had a motor weakness in followed by a ovulum. And she, uh, like starting with, she had distal motor weakness, which uh, progressively uh, shifted to, towards proximal weakness. And there was a definite history of band like sensation over upper abdomen. And there was a history of urinary retention for the past three days uh, for which patient was catheterized. The intensity of uh, weakness increased to a point that patient was unable to get, from, get up from uh, bed, and she, but she was still able to move her limbs in bed. There was no history of any flexor spasm. There was no history of electrical -like sensation. There is no history of uh, low backache per se. And uh, regarding uh, other negative history, she was not uh, giving any history of weakness in upper, upper limb. There was no history of any cranial palsy. There was no history of any constitution. There is no history of, of cases of breathlessness, and there is no history of any abdominal pain, distension, constipation, malina, or bleeding PR. So uh, this is uh, regarding past history. As you can see, uh, she had a history of swelling in, front, in, in the front of neck for the past 18 years, and the size of swelling uh, was gradually progressively increasing. There was no history of any local pressure symptoms, and there was no history suggestive of hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. And regarding personal history, she is a vegetarian. She consumes iris salt. There is no history of any recent loss of weight or appetite. Uh, regarding bowel habits, it's, uh, it was unaltered. And bladder habits, she had retention for past uh, three days for which she was catheterized. And she was having no addictions. Regarding family history, uh, it was uh, not significant. 
regarding menstrual history, uh, she had amenorrhea for the past two years. Most, uh, most probably, she uh, entered into menopause. Other than that, uh, there was nothing significant. So in nutshell, she's a 48-year-old uh, female, postmenopausal since two years, with a background history of goiter for the past 18 uh, years, with no history of any local pressure symptoms. Clinically, she's euthyroid, presented with uh, complaints of motor weakness for both, of both lower limbs since three months, with definite band-like sensation in upper abdomen, with recent urinary retention. So in this background, uh, we consider the possibility of a compressive myelopathy, uh, typically extramillary and extradural. Since she is having a band like sensation above uh, upper abdomen, uh, likely uh, the site of insult might be above T7. And in a setting of uh, such a huge uh, uh, goiter, we suspect the possibility of malignancy, uh, specifically follicular thyroid carcinoma, since it is uh, known to produce uh, bone meds. And we also uh, kept the possibility of uh, chronic infection like uh, port spine. And uh, regarding uh, her goiter, uh, she, from history, she is clinically euthyroid. So you can see a picture. So uh, she was actually having very huge uh, goiter. Clinically, Bruy was actually present. Uh, I was unable to get below the swelling. Uh, interestingly, Pemberton uh, sign was actually negative. Regarding right wing, she was actually having tachycardia and her hands were moist. Other than that, there is uh, no uh, features of thyroid associated ophthalmopathy. She was not uh, having any pre mixed myxedema. Regarding neurological examination, she was having a grade one power in uh, lower limbs uh, and her uh, weakness was more severe towards uh, right side rather than a uh, left side and regarding reflex uh, regarding superficial reflex she was actually having bilateral uh, extensor plantar reflex and regarding deep tendon reflex the ex reflexes were exaggerated uh, in lower limbs and there was a definite sensory level uh, below the level of nipple so it was correlating uh, with t4 uh, dermatome and other systemic examination were fairly within normal limits so after uh, clinical history and examination, uh, diagnosis was kept as paraplegia, human type of paraplegia, with a compressive myelopathy, extramillary, extradural, with the sensory level of T4. And likely etiology might be malignancy uh, due to a thyroid neoplasm, most probably uh, follicular, uh, since it is known to produce uh, bone meds. Uh, uh, but uh, since investigation printing, we also entertain the possibility of uh, tuberculosis. And uh, clinically, uh, from history, she was euthyroid, but uh, since she was having tachycardia and uh, her hands were moist, we also uh, went on to do a TFT. And in TFT, uh, she, interestingly enough, she was found to have a T3 type uh, toxicosis. Uh, we also done a TSHR antibody and anti tpo and both were negative. So she was uh, actually having uh, isolated T3 toxicosis. So we had to start her on already, since she's having a compressive myelopathy, we already started her on steroids. And meanwhile, in order to control her T3 toxicosis, we had to give her a cumulative dose of 40 milligram per day, propanol of uh, 80 milligram per day. So, uh, and after that, uh, obviously, ultrasonography was done, and it was actually showing multinodular goiter with suspicious uh, uh, two nodules, with one having a thyroid score of three, and other was actually having a thyroid score of five. So, this is her uh, x ray. So, you can see uh, even uh, there is uh, like uh, increased soft tissue uh, involvement in neck with uh, like definite uh, macro calcification and this is a CT of this uh, patient. So you can see that there is no uh, retrosternal extension. Interestingly, uh, the patient having a such humongous goiter is not having, that's my reason. Uh, she was actually having a negative from Bertson sign. So this was uh, actually uh, the infiltrated lesion, uh, which was uh, present in D4 and D5, uh, which actually uh, caused paraplegia. And so we uh, went out to do a CT gated FNAC, which actually shows uh, aggregates of uh, microfolic like formation. And many of the cells actually exhibit fire flaring. So, fire flaring uh, is actually uh, a macroscopic vascular uh, appearance uh, that is usually seen uh, in cases of Graves' disease. This actually indicates uh, a functional status of thyroid cells. You can see here, uh, in the uh, cytology part, you can see there uh, a vacuum with central, uh, uh, in central part is not actually stained, which is looking like a, a flaring uh, flame. So that's why it is called fire flaring, which might indicate uh, a functioning uh, differentiated thyroid uh, carcinoma. And uh, we went on to do total thyroid making patient thyroid and uh, actually did a multifocal follicular carcinoma. Uh, in background of uh, colloid goiter. There was capsular invasion. Interestingly enough, uh, histologically, there was no angio invasion or perineural invasion. So uh, after uh, subjecting her for surgery, uh, 
since uh, we are planning to do a whole body scan, uh, she was not offered thyroxine. But after six weeks, uh, even interestingly enough, her TSH is only 2.44. That indicates that she is actually having a functional differentiated thyroid carcinoma. And in whole body scan, you can see uh, like multiple uh, iodine avid lesions uh, in skeletal, uh, in ske including skeletal, as well as there is uptake in uh, uh, pelvis uh, abdomen. So, uh, so in a patient, so this patient, interestingly enough, uh, is a case of metastatic follicular thyroid carcinoma with a stage of two since she is having distant metastasis and she have uh, skeletal related events in the form of spinal cord compression at the level of B4 and she was uh, having functional metastasis, that is isolated T3 toxicosis and she was treated by total thyroidectomy and she was subjected to radioiodine ablation at uh, 200 millicurie. After that, we started her own uh, thyroxine supplementation and finally, her present, uh, presenting complaint uh, was uh, UMN paraplegia, extramillary, extradural compressive myel myelopathy, the metastatic light lesion in B4 and B5. And we also uh, gave her zolendronic acid, 5 milligram IV. So regarding uh, zolendronic acid, uh, there have been uh, various trials comparing uh, uh, the type of bisphosphonate uh, that should be given. And uh, those trial that is zolendronic acid and pamidronate and found that zolendronic acid was actually superior to pamidronate. And it was able to prevent almost 25 uh, 20% of skeletal uh, subsequently in follow. We gave her zolendronic acid. Uh, so, a uh, few like two slides regarding few pearls we actually learned from this case. First is uh, bone mets in uh, follicular thyroid carcinoma. As you all know, uh, follicular thyroid carcinoma is notorious for producing bone mets, and axial skeletal involvement is uh, seems to be more common uh, than peripheral or appendicular skeletal involvement, uh, with skull and spine involvement uh, more uh, common than pelvic involvement. It is said to be due to down regulation of fibronectin and overexpression of bone's yellow protein. And it is said that inferior thyroid vein it, uh, have a direct connection to bats and vertebral venous plexus. This might be the reason for axial uh, involvement in uh, FTC. Regarding and uh, most commonly it produced uh, with a light lesion is due to tumor mediated rank wrangle OPG pathway. And uh, with a skeletal meds, uh, the 10 year survival it will drop down to 13 to 21 percent. Regarding functional DTC, uh, Regarding functional DTC also, follicular thyroid carcinoma is known to produce uh, uh, like functional DTC. And isolated T3 toxin is extremely rare. It is said to be due to increased D2 expression, d expression uh, in FTC. Uh, why uh, a thyroid carcinoma is known to produce this uh, functional status, the exact mechanism is not known, but it is said to be due to aberrant expression of uh, TSHR uh, uh, receptor, which uh, will result in constitutional activation of cyclic AMB pathway. Usually, uh, they will have, usually when there is functional DTC, usually uh, this lesion will be bulky. So, regarding thyrotoxin and DTC, uh, in Graves disease and uh, DTC, uh, it was, uh, as per various studies, uh, the, the prevalence and incidence is different. Uh, fairly, it is 4 to 6 percentage, but it can go up to 17 percentage. And most common uh, functional DTC in setting of Graves disease is uh, uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma and follicular thyroid carcinoma. And uh, the stimulatory TSH antibody and anti apoplectic interleukins that is present in Graves disease is known to nurture uh, uh, the extent of uh, this uh, differential thyroid carcinoma. And uh, regarding imaging uh, per se, X rays are poor uh, like imaging modality to detect uh, bone meds because it uh, requires at least 30 to 50 percent of bone metal loss in order to uh, get that uh, visibility in X ray. Meanwhile, uh, CT is uh, fairly good, it has a sensitivity of around 74 percent ish. And if you're uh, Choosing for a MRI, but to go for a diffusion weighted imaging rather than a standard MRI. And uh, whole body iodine scan definitely post surgery, as patient, in a case of high risk uh, uh, patient, definitely you have to subject the patient for a whole body iodine scan. Uh, and uh, it depends upon differentiation of uh, this uh, carcinoma. And FTG PET currently, ATA recommends FTG PET only if uh, whole body iodine scan is negative uh, and patient is having a rising thyroglobin levels. And this is uh, otherwise called flip uh, flow phenomenon. So that's all uh, regarding uh, uh, this case. Uh, so uh, this is a case of uh, metastatic uh, follicular thyroid carcinoma present with skeletal related events. Uh, and interesting enough, patient was actually having isolated T3 toxicosis. Thank you, Dr. Subin. I think that was a very interesting case. And I think some of our residents are here and uh, they would agree that today we had a discussion of a very similar case. And it's very unfortunate that still we see Patients, uh, you know, with such long-standing goiters going on and on for years and present with such metastatic disease. Today, the patient we finally had 
despite having offered all therapies, finally we had to refer to palliative care because there was so much metastasis and now uh, the rest of the disease is just inoperable and uh, no more uh, iodine therapy as well. So uh, just a couple of points that I'd like to add uh, to what you said. You presented very uh, nicely and covered all the points. Uh, just about T3 toxicosis, you mentioned it's rare, but somehow, uh, you know, in iodine deficient areas, we still tend to see a uh, proportion of people with T3 toxicosis. That's a body's way to, you know, conserve iodine. And if there is thyrotoxicosis, there would be more T3. So when you do get clinically hyperthyroidism with a suppressed TSH in an iodine deficient area, uh, not in the setting of malignancy, but otherwise uh, should consider T3 toxicosis. Another important point that I'd like to highlight is another very important investigation when you uh, evaluate patients where you suspect that whether this metastatic disease is from the thyroid or elsewhere, especially in differentiated thyroid cancer, is uh, to do a thyroglobulin on the FNAC sample. This is something very sensitive and we do it uh, very often and is uh, very easily done. So you don't need a big sample, it's just an FNA deposit and you measure the thyroglobulin, especially in sensitive areas where um, you need a very small needle that you can insert into it. So that's a helpful investigation. The third important point that I'd like to highlight is uh, when you uh, talk of evaluation and staging preoperatively for these patients, be very careful about using CT contrast because you really need to give iodine therapy early to these patients. And if you're given an iodine contrast, that would defer this uh, benefit of iodine therapy early. So do it. At times, you have to do it to stage it, but uh, be cautious if you're using iodine contrast because that's definitely going to delay your iodine therapy. And the last point, talking about bone and uh, uh, giving bisphosphonates and other antidesorptives. So in patients with metastatic disease, uh, we can give these uh, agents more frequently than we just use in postmenopausal osteoporosis, at times even in three months or uh, much more dose than we usually said. But a very good presentation uh, of very interesting case. Uh, good work, Dr. Subin. Thank you, Dr. Subin, and uh, thank you, Dr. Nitin Kapusar, uh, for a very uh, lucid explanation. So I now request Dr. Hari Kumar, sir, to introduce the quiz master for the day, Dr. Saumik Goswami, sir. I think Hari has had yeah, to leave. Yeah, Hari has had to leave. Okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, good evening. It's my pleasure to invite Dr. Saumik, uh, good, excellent speaker and excellent quiz master. And uh, I would say that facing his face is going to be one of the most challenging for the things because we will actually know in how much deep waters we live in the knowledge of thyroidology after listening to his questions. Over to Dr. Somik. Thank you, Dr. Hari. So I believe the, the quiz rules will be spelled out by Dr. Ganavi. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we'll be uh, going through the quiz participation rules. Uh, so, um, uh, to participate in the quiz, uh, having a Zoom app, uh, app in your, on your mobile device or laptop is essential. You are requested to use a laptop for the ease of experience. The quiz will run for about 10 minutes. There will be first two dummy questions followed by the actual quiz. The quiz master will display the case or description by screen sharing a PowerPoint file. The participants should use the polls option to participate in the quiz. All the 10 questions will be available when the poll is launched and answer for all the questions will be submitted at the end of 10 minutes. So to read the case or description, uh, you can close the polls using the X button and again use the polls option to answer the respective question. So before we start off with the actual quiz, I would like to ask uh, the IT team to display the dummy questions. Asmita, can we have the dummy questions, please? Uh, so the first dummy question, uh, in which city is Taj Mahal located? Option A, Chennai, option B, Mumbai, option C, Agra, and option D, Bangalore. Uh, so the second dummy question, how many oceans are there? Option A, 8, option B, 5, option C, 6, and option C, 7. Hope all the participants could log in their answer. Uh, so over to you, sir, uh, now to share your screen and start the quiz. So thank you, Dr. Ganavi, after those wonderful sessions where we had pearls of wisdom and knowledge showered on our participants. It's now time to test their knowledge with the things that we have put up for them. But again, the, the 
questions that will be asked here are not strictly related to the topics that we have discussed so far. So they are somewhat different. They, they encompass other areas of the science of thyroidology. So all the best to all the participants. Put your thinking caps on. And here we have the first question of this quiz today. So you see the image of an individual on your screen and an individual who lived about 700, 750 years ago. He was a person from Venice, a merchant of Venice, you could put it that way, who wrote in his famous book that while traveling through Turkestan, which is present day Central Asia, more or less the province of Xinjiang in China, the people of the province of Karkan in that place had in general been afflicted with swellings in the legs and tumors in the throat, occasioned by the quality of water they drink, which is one of the, not only one of the first good descriptions of people with hypothyroidism and goiter, but it also speaks of the etiology, possible etiology of the condition. So who is this merchant of Venice that I'm talking of? And you have your four options to choose from. I need a cue from the IT team whether we can move to the next question. Yeah, so uh, maybe yes, ten seconds. Yeah, Good. ten seconds for every. <laughs> so the next okay. question again is a clinical question. So from history to clinics, you have the image of a four-year-old boy who presented with a painful and tender swelling in front of the neck, most likely involving the thyroid gland. The skin was erythematous and it was worn to touch. And if you look at the ultrasound image, it showed a large irregular hypoechoic area. The question is not the diagnosis of the condition, but rather which is the possible underlying congenital anomaly that has led to this condition. And you have your four options to choose from. Um, you can read out the answers so then that uh, the options are a thyroglossal cyst b pyriform sinus fistula is it c lingual thyroid or do you feel d it's an enlarged pyramidal lobe of the thyroid so the next question we move on to question number three a single image that of a fdg pet ct scan we are using this modality of investigation uh, more frequently nowadays for a variety of purposes. And in this image, you find an uptake, a nodal uptake in the left lobe of the thyroid. So what is the risk of malignancy if you get such a nodal FDG CT uptake in a thyroid lobe? Is it 5 to 10 percent? Is it 10 to 20 percent? Is it 15 to 30 percent? Or do you think it's as high as 25 to 50 percent? You have your four options to choose from. So this is sort of a simple question, a sitter. We move on to the next question, question number four. This again is a clinical question. We have a description, but not an image here. A 10-year-old boy who presented with delay in linear growth, delay in tooth eruption, slowing of speech, reduction in muscle tone, impairment in fine motor coordination, as well as severe constipation. There was macrocephaly, reduction in heart rate and blood pressure. And overall, clinically, the phenotype was suggestive of hypothyroidism. His biochemistry showed that his free T4 was low normal, his free T3 was high normal, and his TSH was normal. A total reverse T3 was also done, which was low compared to the normal reference range. And an X-ray of the skull showed thickening of the calvarium. So what do you think is this boy suffering from? Is it thyroid hormone resistance due to thyroid receptor alpha mutation? Or is it thyroid hormone resistance due to thyroid receptor beta mutation? Or could it be central hypothyroidism? Or are we dealing with hypothyroidism, which is related to iodine deficiency? So you have your four options to choose from. Phenotypic hypothyroidism with nearly normal biochemistry. We now move over to the fifth question. 
The fifth question, again, is a straightforward question. You see an image here. This is an ultrasonography image of a 39-year-old woman who presents with a swelling in the lower lobe of the thyroid. Uh, FNA is done, and the aspiration reveals a watery, clear, and colorless fluid. So what is the most probable diagnosis? What is the ultrasound showing here? Is it a thyroid cyst? Is it a degenerated lymph node of the neck? Is it a parathyroid cyst or is it medullary thyroid cancer with degeneration in a nodule? So you have four options to choose from. So we are halfway through with five questions. The next five question, question number six coming up. So question number six again shows you two different images. The image above shows an X-ray of the skull after a certain surgical intervention was done to manage proptosis in this patient. Subsequently, an exophthalmometer was used to measure the degree of residual proptosis. You have to name the exophthalmometer that is being used in this image. Is it a Hertel's exophthalmometer? A Nogle's exophthalmometer? Is it a Luid exophthalmometer? Or is it a Graves exophthalmometer? You have four options to choose from. An intervention was done and an exophthalmometer is being used here. Which is the exophthalmometer? We now move on to question number seven. So question number seven coming up, again, a single image. An ultrasonography of a thyroid nodule in a 40-year-old man. And you see a white arrow pointing to something important. So what would be the tirads level in this patient? You have the image in front of you. Would it be TR1 or would it be 2 or would it be 3 or would it be 4? You have four options to choose from. A white arrow pointing to something important. An ultrasound image of thyroid nodule in a 40-year-old man and four options to choose from regarding the risk of malignancy. We now move over to the eighth question. We have three more questions left. Eighth question of the quiz, and this is an interesting question. You see a series of images where several eye movements are being tested. In the, in the first image, the image on the top, up gaze is being tested. In the second image, right lateral gaze is being tested. In the third image, left lateral gaze is being tested. So looking at these three different images with different gazes being tested, you have to tell me which are the involved muscles in this patient with Graves' disease. Is it the right superior rectus and right medial rectus? Is it the right inferior rectus and right lateral rectus? Or is it the right superior rectus, right medial rectus, and the right levator palpebrae superioris? Or is it the right inferior rectus, right lateral rectus, and the right levator palpebrae superioris? So I'll give you just four or five more seconds because you have to deal with three images here and give me a specific answer. So I think we can now move over to the penultimate question, question number nine. And this is something very important and very practical. And if you have gone through the, the some of the recent issues of thyroid research and practice, I think you'll get this one. So what is the impact of postprandial state on the thyroid function test? Is there a decrease in increase in free T4 and decrease in TSH in the postprandial state? Or is there a decrease in free T4 as well as a decrease in TSH? Or is there an increase in free T3 and a decrease in TSH? Or the fourth option is there a decrease in free T3 and a decrease in TSH. So you have different permutations and combinations of T3, T4, and TSH to deal with. What would be the correct answer in this case? We move over now to the final question of this Wednesday's thyroid session. The question is, all of the following drugs can be used for the treatment of very symptomatic patients with thyrotoxicosis facticia. Usually you do not need treatment, but in very symptomatic patients, you might need treatment. All of the following can be used except one. Which is the correct answer? Is it 
A methimazole or is it B propranolol or is it C cholestyramine or is the correct answer D iopanoic acid? And I think this question has some relation to the discussions that we have had over the past hour or so. So we have uh, shared all the 10 questions that were scheduled for today. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, I now request you to discuss the answers uh, okay. as uh, the IT team requires some time for collating the results, sir. Okay, so so I think by the time we discuss the answers, the results will be ready. Yes, you know, um, the I first. Think, uh, can we do the ITS presentation and then have the answers? Sure, sure, sure. sure. Uh, so while they're preparing, Yes, I'm stopping then the answers and then, yeah. Uh, Ma'am, actually, the IT team said that uh, they would uh, uh, present the slides themselves. Uh, so, uh, yeah. yes. over to them, yeah. Yes, sir. Asmita. So while the results are being collated, uh, let us go through the glimpse, let us just glimpse through the journey of ITS. So uh, that is the Indian Thyroid Society. So Indian Thyroid Society has been conducting the has been conducting the thyroid clinics under the leadership of the eminent conveners that has already been portrayed before. So basically, Indian Thyroid Society was established and registered in 2003. It is a national body of healthcare professionals with special interests in thyroid disorders. Uh, endocrinologists, endocrine surgeons, nuclear medicine physicians, general physicians, general surgeons, and ENT surgeons are part of the ITS. ITS is a member of the IOTA, that is the Asia Oceana Thyroid Association. ITS currently has nearly 2,000 members. So the executive committee of the Indian Thyroid Society uh, has Dr. Uh, Pro Professor Avi Jaikumar sir as the founder professor, president and Professor Sarita Bajaj Madam as the president. So also in the executive committee is, uh, is uh, Professor Rajesh Ratput sir, who is the past president, Dr. Arun Menon sir, who is presently the secretary, and Dr. Maniji Pillai ma'am, who is presently the treasurer. Also, Dr. Himagirish K. Rao, sir, uh, is the vice president. Uh, Dr. Pramila Kaldra, madam, is the scientific committee coordinator. And Dr. Sujai Ghosh, sir, is the joint secretary. So Dr. Shashank Joshi, sir, Dr. P.K. Jabbar, sir, and Dr. Krishna Sheshadri are all members of the executive committee. Dr. Mohammad Riyas, sir, Dr. Sushil Gupta, and Dr. Ashraf Chani, sir, are also members of the executive committee. So the aims of the Indian Thyroid Society is uh, to organize academic activities for healthcare professionals, to promote public education and awareness about thyroid disorders, to encourage research in thyroidology, to encourage publication in the flagship journal that is the Thyroid Research and Practice, to have state-of-the-art publications and to award fellowship of the society and to encourage membership of the society. So the ongoing academic activities which are undertaken by the Indian Thyroid Society is uh, this, there are many CMEs, updates, symposia and conferences which are being conducted. Also the thyroid clinics which were initially conducted weekly which are now being held fortnightly. Uh, multiple topics are being discussed, uh, like uh, there are also uh, journal clubs, case conversations, monologue, dialogue, panel discussion. Also, we have meet the professor session, the quiz workshop, as well as the CPCs, which are being conducted. So the programs which are taken up by the Indian Thyroid Society are uh, the Thyroid Awareness Week, which is uh, celebrated between May 22nd to May 28th. Then we also have the World Thyroid Day, which is celebrated on May 25th. Then we have the Thyroid Awareness Month, which is celebrated annually in the month of January. The research activities taken up by the Indian Thyroid Society are uh, ITS basically provides annual grants for the original research studies, which are focused on thyroid and other related disorders, preferably in the Indian context. The research grants are available, uh, available. to apply. Uh, the details can be accessed in the website, that is the Indian Thyroid Society. In. So uh, re uh, regarding the Indian Thyroid Society journal, that is the Thyroid Research in Practice, it is published twice a year in print as well as online. It has a quick turnaround time. Uh, electronic copies are available uh, ahead of print. Uh, so relate, uh, coming to the fellowship, which is awarded by the Indian Thyroid Society, it is basically awarded to the ITS members who have expertise and exp experience in the field of thyroidology. Uh, it will be selected by an expert panel. The eligible members will be conferred the fellow of Indian Thyroid Society, that is the FITS. 
So uh, the publications by the Indian Thyroid Society include the ITS Clinical Manual of Thyroid Disorders, the first edition, the editor of which is Professor Avi Jaikumasa. Also numerous guidelines have been published by the Indian Thyroid Society, like the thyroid dysfunction in pregnancy, the guidelines for the management of thyroid dysfunction during pregnancy, hypothyroidism and diabetes, also other guidelines like the consensus statement on the management of subclinical hypothyroidism, guidelines for the management of dyslipidemia and thyroid dysfunction, also guidelines for the management of depression and thyroid dysfunction have been published. The upcoming publications by the Indian Thyroid Society include the ITS Clinical Textbook of Thyroid Disorders. The chief editors are uh, Dr. Sarita Bajaj Madam and Dr. Rajesh Raputsa. Also, upcoming guidelines uh, will be published in the year 2022 and 2023. They include the management of subclinical hypothyroidism, management of thyroid disorders in pregnancy, and management of thyroid carcinoma. Uh, the website of the Indian Thyroid Society can be uh, accessed through the link that is the Indian Thyroid Society dot in. Uh, the contents which are uh, present in this website include the link to guidelines, access to the ITS journals. It also has records of all the academic events. Also, an online membership portal is also available. So uh, the membership of the Indian Thyroid Society is awarded to all the MCI registered modern medical practitioners in India. There are two types of life membership which is awarded. Uh, the amount of membership is rupees 2950. Uh, full time life membership uh, is awarded to the specialists in the field of endocrinology, endocrine surgery, and nuclear membership medicine, whereas uh, associate life membership is awarded to all the other registered medical practitioners. So the membership, uh, uh, basically the applications are invited online on the ITS website and the details can be accessed on the following link, that is the Indian Thyroid Society. Uh, so basically, as I already told you, the thyroid clinics which are being held, which were being held weekly and now being held fortnightly as under the leadership of the foremost eminent conveners, that is Professor Sarita Bajaj Madam, who is presently the uh, president of ITS, Dr. Pramila Kalra Madam, uh, who is presently the scientific chair, Dr. Mini G. Pillai Ma'am, who is the treasurer, and Dr. Arun Menansa, who is the secretary of ITS. Uh, so uh, we have uh, had uh, about 16 sessions so far, including today, uh, starting from 6th April. So uh, we have had journal clubs, case discussions, monologues, dialogues, uh, which were conducted. There were also sessions carried out by eminent figures in the field of endocrinology, nuclear medicine, radio diagnosis, endocrine surgery, and also experts in the field of histopathology and cytopathology. We also had a distinguished uh, dignitaries from abroad, Dr. Vil uh, Vivian Lin uh, from Singapore as a speaker and panelist as well. We also had a CPC uh, in the month of July. So all these events were possible under the constant guidance of our conveners. Um, Dr. Sarita Bajaj Madam, Dr. Pramila Ma'am, Dr. Minig Ma'am, and Dr. Arud Sir. So uh, for our next session, um, uh, that is on 2nd November, uh, we will be having an interesting case discussion on thyroid associated ophthalmopathy. Uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Alok Looks as if uh, Gandhi yeah. has. Yeah, Arun, can you take uh, over and tell yeah. us about the ITS con? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Gandhi. I mean, you have done a wonderful job over the last few months of um, holding these meetings together and coordinating it. Uh, thank you, Pramila. Uh, it's been great. Uh, I just want to take a few seconds uh, just to inform you about um, some uh, very interesting programs that we're going to have. Uh, as Gandhi was just saying there, the last of the uh, thyroid clinics will be next week, uh, sorry, in two weeks' time. Uh, after that, uh, as you all know, the Thyroid Awareness Month comes in January um, of each year. So January 2023, uh, we are planning a mega event, which is in collaboration with ESI. Uh, I think that's going to be the highlight. So the very first time we are doing something of that uh, nature. So this is going to be a daily Facebook live program, uh, which would involve pretty much all 
uh, senior as well as junior uh, endocrinologists. So it's not just a senior show, it's, it's going to be a show of uh, um, um, endocrinologists. This is catered towards the public. Uh, and it's going to be in the format of panel discussions. So I think it's going to be very interesting. I would request all of you to join, interact, and make this uh, an interesting program. So there's going to be 30, uh, 30 days consecutive programs. In between, I think there is the ESI Foundation Day, which is on January 10th. Uh, so that I'm sure ESI is planning uh, a, ma a major event for that as well. Um, so that is, uh, please be on the lookout. We'll come out with uh, the exact program and uh, please participate and make it a success. The second uh, equally important and perhaps even more important would be uh, the ITS con, which we are planning in May, 20, uh, in May of 2023, uh, May 27th and 28th. And we are planning this in Cochin. Uh, the, the arrangements are already um, going in full steam now. Uh, so please be on the lookout. We will certainly be sending you reminders and information about all these things. Uh, so, and we look forward to welcoming you to Kuchin and I'm sure we'll have a wonderful ITS con next year. Thank you. Madam, would you like to add something before uh, we move on? Yeah, so I think Anvi has given a very good overview. Uh, Arun's told you about the Thyroid Awareness Month. We just focused um, on a daily thyroid awareness program targeting uh, the public. It will be a question answer format. I'll be, there'll be three experts with a coordinator and a moderator. And like he said, it will be every day for the 31 day month. Um, I think, Pramila, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's going to be the highlight because we haven't done this type of thing before in collaboration with ESI and it's going to be very interesting. So uh, we will be discussing all the topics concerning thyroid starting from the prevalence and hypo, hyper, subclinical, thyroid ophthalmopathy and many other topics which are there. So it will be all interesting topics which will be discussed. And as Dr. Arun said, it will be both senior and junior endocrinologist who will be part of it. So that will be more interesting because we will get two points of view. So because thyroid, a lot of things are there which are very debatable. So there may be different schools of thought. Like even we had discussions today in the duologue and the monologue. So I know that there are lots of things which are still debatable in th regarding thyroid disorders. So I think that will be very interesting. And we are all uh, waiting for that. And I think our residents are also liking this a lot. And uh, these thyroid clinics are among the favorites uh, for the resident because all the residents look forth for this. So this is another thing which is very interesting. And I think we'll, we should plan to continue these clinics after we finish the thyroid awareness in future as well, because uh, uh, at least a fortnightly or a monthly would be a good option to continue because these things have been uh, in the pipeline for long, but we were never discussing these things too much regarding thyroid because we were all be discussing diabetes and other things, but thyroid was not much into it. So I think uh, this is a very interesting thing which should continue in future as well. And that's what we plan to do. So as we are doing all this under the guidance of Professor Saita Bajaj, ma'am, and I think she has helped us a lot to do these things. And she is the person who is doing all these things. We are just there. That's it. But madam is doing everything. Thank you. And we'll also have a patient's perspective also. So I think that will be one very extra special program in which we'll have patients come in and tell about the experiences. So I think it's time for the quiz answers now, Somik. Yes, ma'am. So let me quickly give out the quiz answers. Okay. So there we are. So the famous merchant from Venice that we are talking of is none other than the colorful and famous Marco Polo. So the answer would be B, Marco Polo. If you look at the image, this boy is suffering from acute suppurative thyroiditis, which is something which is very rare, particularly in the pediatric age group. So usually these children have an intact pyriform sinus fistula, which is an embryonic remnant of, of the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches, which fail to obliterate. So there's a source of infection there. Otherwise, they do not usually have suppurative thyroiditis at this age. A very high risk of malignancy of 25 to 50 percent, as high as 50 percent, can be seen with a focal FDG uptake in the thyroid gland. 
diagnosis that we were talking of here is a thyroid receptor alpha mutation. The classical picture is that of clinical phenotype matching with hypothyroidism, but having almost normal biochemistry. We know that the thyroid receptor alpha mutation individuals have thyroid sensitivity at the level of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. They have sensitivity at the level of the liver, but there is resistance at the level of the heart. There is resistance at the level of the skeletal system, and there's resistance at the level of the gastrointestinal system with the exception of the liver. Clear fluid from a cyst near or close to the thyroid is almost always a parathyroid cyst. Thyroid cysts usually give amber color fluid. It's not a clear colored fluid. So a clear, watery, colorless fluid goes almost definitely in favor of a parathyroid cyst. The answer that we were looking for here is a Nogley exophthalmometer. If you look at the image above, the, the individual here has undergone lateral orbitotomy, removal of the lateral wall of the orbit, surgical decompression for treating her exophthalmus. So if you have the lateral walls removed, you cannot use the classic Hertel's exophthalmometer because they take the lateral orbital rim as the reference point. The Nogley exophthalmometer takes the superior and inferior orbital rims as the reference point and can be used in patients who have undergone removal of the lateral wall of the orbit. So the correct answer here would be the Nogley exophthalmometer. The answer that I was looking for here is this is a benign nodule. If you look at the white arrow, it is pointing to what is called the comet tail, tail artifact. So the hyper uh, echoic region or intense region above is a uh, what you call inspissated colloid. And below it, you get the comet tail artifact. The common differential is microcalcification, but microcalcification lacks the classic comet tail artifact that is seen with inspissated colloids. So this is a benign, benign nodule, that's one. So this was a very interesting question. The correct answer would be three muscles are involved. If you look at the image carefully, there is some grouping of the right eyelid, the right upper eyelid. And we know that patients with Graves' disease might have associated ocular myasthenia and it might begin unilaterally initially. So there is involvement of the right lateral, right levator palpebrae superioris, possibly due to ocular myasthenia. In the first image on up gaze, the right eye is not going up. And we have to remember that in Graves' ophthalmopathy, we are dealing with restrictive ophthalmopathy rather than paralytic ophthalmopathy. So the right inferior rectus is fibrosed. It's preventing the right eye from looking upwards. In the lowest image, you see that the right eye doesn't look medially. So there is involvement of the right lateral rectus as well, which is restricting the right medial movement of the right eye. So again, the correct answer would be right inferior rectus, right lateral rectus, infiltrative ophthalmopathy or restrictive ophthalmopathy in those muscles and the right levator palpebrae superior is involved due to ocular myasthenia. The ninth question, as I said, you would get the answer if you were a regular reader of the, of the flagship journal of the Indian Thyroid Society, Thyroid Research and Practice. And the correct answer would be in the postprandial state, there is a decrease in free T3 and a decrease in TSH. So it's Important to do the thyroid function test in the fasting state in the morning because, again, there are diurnal variations in the thyroid function test. Final question and the final answer would be methimazole. If you have a lot of exogenous thyroid hormone in your system, there is no point in preventing your thyroid gland from making more hormones. You have to first stop the peripheral conversion of the hormone or stop the symptoms that could occur because of increased exogenous levothyroxine in your system. And B, C, and D, all three of them would do the job. Methimazole would have no action on the exogenous levothyroxine that is there in your system. So thank you. And I think we'll, it's now time to get the results of the quiz. Sir, I think the IT team require a few more minutes to collate their results. Okay. Can I just quickly intervene? And Nitin was just asking me about the dates of ITS con once again. I just want to uh, say that, that dates again. It's May 27th and 28th, which is Saturday and Sunday, uh, obviously next year, 2023. 
So please block those dates in your diary straight away. Uh, I'm sure we will inform everything else in due course. Thank you. And the thyroid, the World Thyroid Day is 25th. Absolutely. And yeah, uh, we're not clubbing that uh, as one stretch. So World that's... Thyroid Day will be 25th, which is a Thursday. So Friday, there's nothing. So this Friday, Thursday is more of um, maybe a hybrid presentation. But Certainly. this is going to be entirely physical, right? The Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's very important. So we are, we are hoping that the COVID won't intervene again. COVID or anything like anything strange won't intervene again. And we'll have a purely physical meeting. That's no hybrid, no virtual. Nitin, there are a few questions in the chat box, which I think need to be addressed, please. Oh. Or have they been addressed? Most have been addressed, ma'am. Only the last question by Dr. Pankaj regarding the correlation between thyroids 3 and 4 with FNAC and biopsy. So uh, we did a study a couple of years ago uh, looking at our uh, patients with thyroids 3, 4, A, B, and C. Now, uh, very important to remember that uh, this is very different from BIRAD score, uh, you know, where uh, 4 and 5 are really bad. Here, uh, 4A also does not have such a high risk as BIRAD score. So the, the different percentages by different societies in our uh, population, I think we get worried mainly when it's 4B and 4C. 4A, we are cautious, but whatever be the thyroid score, we again look at the bigger picture. We look at the patient as a whole, the age of the patient, the other risk factors, the family history, uh, you know, clinical examination, FNAC report, and then we come to a decision. They might be at thyroid 3 that I might be convincing for surgery, and they might be thyroid 4A, which I just say close follow up. So it's just not one thing that we harp on. Thank you. What is your experience with patients of severe hypothyroidism having to undergo emergency surgery? So, because ma'am, it was a very big tertiary care center. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, when I was a resident, we had a cytomelot T3 available, and uh, we used to give it uh, three days uh, pre op and two days post op and happily clear them. Though we used to sit in, really sit bedside and monitor heart rate at least thrice and noted down in our notes. Uh, but ever since T3 is not available, I did answer the first question uh, about how IV T4 can be made within the hospital, how our hospital makes it. Maybe I'll put it again in the chat box. Uh, and then IV thyroxine is given. I think the most important thing, again, is more clinical uh, judgment, the heart rate of the patient. And uh, if that all is fine, then we still clear with normal T4, even if TSH is high. But severe hypothyroidism, electively, obviously, we'd like to wait because more chances of bleeding, more chances of uh, delayed recovery, post-op and extubation which becomes difficult. But uh, those who require emergency surgery, IV T4 plus uh, normalization of T4, normalization of heart rate and improvement of other clinical parameters is helpful. And obviously, with mild and moderate, is just, just go ahead. You wouldn't, yes, of course, moderate... I think Sanjay had a rider there that you need to um, be aware that there, there may be some complications associated. Fortunately, as far as hyper is concerned, we would definitely wait unless it's subclinical for severe hyperthyroidism. Uh, I think we would, there's no way we can go ahead with the surgery. Even when they plan thyroid surgery uh, for the thyroid per se, I think they give IOD for two weeks at least to decrease the vascularity of the gland and before they decide to operate. I don't think they would do it straight away anyway. And with this combination of corticosteroids uh, with iodine and um, propyl PTU and beta blocker, of course, I think how soon can we make sure that the patient is comfortable? If I'm not wrong, I think 20, even 48 within 48 hours, the patient can be made um, comfortable at least as far as Def the management. Definitely, ma'am. And, and again, the beta blockers, uh, we don't have to be conservative. Very high doses of beta blockers can also be given, uh, provided obviously there's no contraindication, no bronchial asthma. But uh, I think being liberal with beta blockers is also very important in this Absolutely. case. Absolutely. And I thought uh, dexamethasone would be the preferred steroid because that has the additional advantage of blocking the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. 
Yes, ma'am. There, there are papers to cite both sides. So Dr. Yes. Badada said hi to court and yeah, so as long as that, both... Yes, ma'am. But to you're right. The additional advantage of dexamethasone is there uh, with the uh, caveats of long-standing steroids and other problems. So as long as in the exam you are asked, you should have your paper ready which you are citing and what is the evidence, but you will find evidence for both. Great. So I think the results were announced. Can yeah, we, can we read it out? Can we? Or, yes. or is it uh, is uh, to Saumik there? Yes, so, Saumik, it's your privilege to read out the names. Dr. Goswami, is he there? So we have the winners finally. The, yeah. the okay. second run out of is Dr. Sagar Soda. The first runner of is Dr. Swikriti Jana, and the winner of this Wednesday's quiz is Dr. Pankaj Patwari. A big hand to all the winners and all the participants as well. And of course, to the quiz master for the wonderful questions. That's great. I think possibly the, the best 10 questions. And thank you. Thank you for specially mentioning our flagship journal. Yes, Pramila, I think <laughs> we've, we've been requesting for the last couple of yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, it's again a request to all the audience, also all those who are attending, that if you have any articles, case reports, full text, review articles, please send it to Indian Thyroid Society, our journal. It's a society journal. Please send your articles. We'll send it for peer review and let you know. And the process is very fast. So please do it because we uh, have this journal, which is run by the Indian Thyroid Society. And we do need to send articles to our journal as well. And it's quite a good journal. So please send your articles to ITS I, journal, please. Thyroid Research and Practice. That is the journal name. Another important point I just want to mention now that the PGs are there. Uh, I know many have left now. But it is the fact that we have announced uh, a PG research grant for the postgraduate uh, thesis. Uh, we have got a very short uh, interval uh, for the last date. Uh, so very short turnaround time. So please, if you haven't heard about it, please go to the ITS website. It is on the ITS website. Uh, the last date is October 30th. And we are giving uh, grants up to one lakh for uh, the postgraduate thesis projects. Uh, and there should be a, quite a few that we should be able to give as long as those projects are in thyroid disorders. Um, so uh, please uh, take a note of that and uh, please be quick. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we'll call it a night now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nitin. Thank you so much, Somik. And I think uh, Sanjay has left and so has Hari. Thank you, Ganvi. Thank you, Arun. Thank you, Mini. Good night, Pramila. Thank you so Good much. Night. Good night, everyone. Good night. So the next, uh, uh, Gandhi, can you just tell us about the next program? Yes, ma'am. So for our next session on 2nd November, uh, we have uh, Dr. Alok Sachan, sir, as the chairperson, uh, uh, Dr. Sanjay Saran, sir, sir, and also Dr. Roshmi Gupta, ma'am, as uh, the moderators. So basically, a case uh, on uh, thyroid-associated ophthalmopathy will be discussed. Uh, we also have a quiz by Dr. Rajiv Singla, sir, followed by the monologue by Dr. Nihal Thomas, sir, on uh, nightmarish neurological nuisances, nuts and noxiousness uh, in thyroid diseases. So uh, uh, we look forward for uh, all the enthusiastic participation from the residents as well as all the faculty. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, ma'am. Good night, everyone. Thanks.